This is Undaunted Life, a man's podcast. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Let's get into it. All right, guys, today I've got a special guest on the podcast. His name is Harold Kronk. So Harold is a writer, director, and film producer. So he's uh, been the director of films that you've probably heard of. God's Not Dead, God's Not Dead Part 2, and Unbroken Path to Redemption, amongst others. And then he also recently released a children's book that I'm holding up in front of the camera right now. And it's a children's book for young boys, specifically titled The Beard Ballad. And the foreword was written by the one and only Phil Robertson. Guys, I really enjoyed this interview because... You know, we actually recorded this a little bit yesterday, but there was a bunch of crazy stuff that happened with the technology. We ended up having to scrap the entire interview and just redo it. And I feel like the second one was even better. We got to get into some different things because I asked him about what it was like being in Christian filmmaking, what it was like being a Christian that does films, what it was like being in Hollywood. Can you be an outspoken Christian and work in Hollywood? We, you know, his favorite director, we got into all that, but then we got into some of his films and we got into, you know, why critics kind of rip Christian movies and, and what we can do as the audience to basically help, you know, how he deals with all those negative critics and all the things like that. But then we got into the new book and we got into masculinity. We got into how it's very, very important to teach young boys that there's no such thing as as toxic masculinity in terms of how the culture is defining it, but there's a biblical way to define it. But as fathers, what we should do to kind of raise up our young men to be very, very masculine and to embrace that masculine side. Guys, we got into a lot of great detail. I really, really enjoyed how this went, but I'm not going to keep them from you any longer. So without further ado, let's get into it. Harold Crunk, welcome to Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Hey, Kyle. Thanks for having me. I'm so glad to have you. And guys, you know, I, sometimes I let you peek behind the curtain. We break that fourth wall or dimension or whatever. I've technically done this interview before, but we had so many technical issues yesterday. There was a snowstorm. There was all kinds of crazy crap going on. So it's going to be the first time you're hearing these answers, but I'm going to do my best to make sure this is just as mentally enthralling for you as it should be for our listeners. But Harold, you kind of have a unique uh, industry that you work in, right? So you've spent almost your entire adult life working in the film industry. So it's obviously a very sexy, very unique industry to work in. I don't really, frankly, know very many people that do that for a living. And I understand as a, as a kid or when you were younger, you were into theater and you've done set design and a bunch of different things. But for you, when did you decide to make filmmaking a career? Oh, goodness. Um, you know, my, my dad was a public school superintendent. And uh, my senior year in high school, I told him I wanted to go to art school to be a filmmaker. And he said, no. <laughs> yeah. And I said, OK. Um, my dad, with all of his wisdom, he said, you know, go get your art education degree, become a teacher. And uh, then you can use your time off to pursue those other passions and talents. And so that's what I did. You know, I, um, I coached everything that I could um, while teaching uh, so that I could use that money to buy camera equipment and uh, basically taught myself uh, everything I could about filmmaking. So when you're learning about filmmaking, I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of misconceptions about what it's like working in, on a film or working with actors or working with producers. And again, like I, the most fancy work I've done with a camera has been with one of these, with one of these smartphones, right? So I'm sure there's a lot of things from the outside looking in that we just assume goes on in your world. But what are some of those misconceptions about what it's like actually working in that world? Yeah. So everybody thinks it's really exciting and a lot of fun, but in, in a lot of ways, it's pretty boring. And okay. <laughs> a bunch of the productions we've done here in Michigan, um, you know, when we first started our studio in, in Manistee, Michigan, we would have people show up on set to come and see the movie stars and, and watch the film production happen. And they expected to see explosions and cars flipping right. over. And uh, after people stood around for about 10 or 15 min minutes watching our, our Gripen Electric team set up lights and haul cable, uh, they kind of meandered away. <laughs> Um, so it's a lot of standing around uh, and waiting, like hurry up and wait is kind of the thing, you know, on film sets. Um, and then you, you get to shoot for, you know, the, the extent of whatever the scene is, you know, maybe maybe 10 seconds. So it could be one shot. It could be, you know, a master shot that takes three minutes. Um, and then you start all over again with moving lights. And uh, so I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions. 
Well, so from your perspective, and I actually didn't ask you this uh, before, I'm just curious for someone like you that actually makes films. You don't just watch them because, you know, some people watch things and they think they understand it. It's like you can watch baseball, but you don't really understand baseball unless you've played it. You don't understand the nuance. So for, for your money, right, if you had to point to some of the best directors that you know, of people that make films that are just like spectacular, that even blow your mind as a filmmaker, who are some of those people that, you know, even just inspire you because of how skillful they are? Oh goodness. I'm a Spielberg guy. Steven okay. Spielberg, um, for me is just such a huge inspiration and was such a, a innovator and such a maverick. Um, I'm, I'm a star Wars fan too. So the, uh, the original, uh, star Wars film, George Lucas was, you know, very inspiring to me. Um, but JJ Abrams today, I think is, is really a incredible visual storyteller and, uh, someone that I always, I've always looked up to his writing is fantastic. Um, so yeah, there's, and there's a couple, uh, Guy Ritchie. I'm a Guy Ritchie fan. He's a little raw, a little rough around the edges, but um, um, but he he uh, he always has a point of view, and uh, some of his stylistic choices are really amazing. I think it's interesting too when you're watching films as well. Here I am talking as if I'm a film critic. Let me go and pull out my pipe and my uh, you know my brandy. But you know when you're watching films. There are a lot of films now that are visually appealing. Like the shots look good. The the excitement is there. There's the explosions, like you mentioned. There's all this crazy stuff, but there's no story. Like there's absolutely nothing going on. Like that's why I have such problems with a lot of these uh, comic book movies, especially the Marvel ones. I get way more out of the darker ones like Joker or the Dark Knight stuff uh, that was done like uh, with, uh, oh gosh, who's the director? Um, you know, the the Dark, the Dark Knight trilogy with... Uh, Christian Bale and all that. I'm forgetting the director for whatever reason, Christopher Nolan. But like right. you have these stories that happen where it's like, there's a lot of cool things that happen and maybe some funny things, but then it's just a letdown at the end. Do you feel like that's kind of happening a lot more now? Or is that just kind of always been a thing with movies? Yeah, I think spectacle is something that the studios really want to have uh, to entertain audiences, entertain the masses. They think that's what they're looking for. And uh, it's really actually an interesting, in interesting point because you're right. Watching some of the bigger action adventure films, some of some big superhero movies, when you just see these people who are essentially gods pummeling each other where there's no consequences and there's right. no effect on them, it's it, it kind of loses its impact. Um, so, yeah, I think concentrating on, on character and story structure based on character is is something that um, is it's the way that that I try to connect with an audience. Right. Well, they're obviously doing something right. They've made tens of billions of dollars off those movies. But like when people ask me, Hey, if you watch the new, whatever the fill in the blank Marvel movie is, I'm like, no, but I can tell you how it goes. The world's definitely going to end. It's the darkest, meanest person they've ever seen. The world's going to end. But at the last moment, this superhero that dresses up like a cat or dresses up, uh, you know, throws a hammer at people, they're going to save the world at the very last moment. It's amazing. It's incredible. It's as if I'm a clairvoyant, like I know what's going to happen. Now for you, you work obviously with a lot of Christians because you do a lot of Christian filmmaking and we'll get more into that here in just a second. But it seems like from the outside looking in, and I don't know how much you deal directly with Hollywood or, you know, any of that stuff behind the scenes because I know Hollywood isn't the only place that makes, makes films, but it seems like it's legitimately impossible to be an outspoken evangelical Christian and to work in Hollywood, like to be an evangelical director or to be an evangelical Christian. Uh, that's a very outspoken Christian. That is a main actor, like an A-lister or something like that. I mean, maybe Chris Pratt is like the one that comes to mind or something like that, but it doesn't seem like these people can have any long-term success if they really, really are truly Christians. Am I crazy? Am I maybe buying into some sort of like conservative Twitter narrative or is that kind of how it is? Boy, man, I, I, it's uh, that's a that's a difficult question uh, for me personally. I haven't had anyone um, really take me out of contention or consideration for something because of that that I know of. Um, I mean, I've, I've had a few instances meeting with meetings in Hollywood where I could tell that the people were maybe meeting with me more because they were curious about who this this guy is that made this movie called God's Not Dead, and they wanted to see if I was a, a, a a crazy kooky person or something. But, um, but you know, I, I think it all depends on who you work with. Um, I've had the opportunity to work with some amazing people in Hollywood who could care what, less what my belief system is. They were, they were more concerned about what my talents were and working with, with cast and telling stories. 
Well, I think that goes back to when people are like, okay, are you a filmmaker that's a Christian or are you a Christian filmmaker? Are you a rapper that's a Christian or are you a Christian rapper? And I think the the moment you put the qualifier of Christian before something, people expect something different. But I feel like this is maybe the appropriate time, Harold, to address the elephant in the room, which I know a lot of people are thinking about right now, is that you made a lot of films that were directly for a Christian audience. You mentioned God is Not Dead, and, and we'll get into some others. But Christian films don't exactly have a great reputation for being very mm. good or even pleasurable to watch. For the most part, they get crushed by critics. So why do you think there's that stigma in reputation? Because for my money, it can't all just be imaginary or the work of the devil or, you know, some sort of like democratic, you know, the thing that they're going to be this cabal of negative things towards Christian filmmaking. Like, why is that the stigma that we see? Sure. Well, I, I think that there's that stigma because a lot of Christian films have been poorly made or poorly produced. And um, look, we, we've, we're called to be excellent in our craft, right? And I think that we need to, to continue to work on that. We need to promote young filmmakers who have the talents and the abilities to, to be in the positions where they're making films for the studios, not necessarily Christian movies, but just having a person um, with that worldview uh, in a position of power where they're telling stories for the masses. And I think one of the challenge, challenges that, that Christian filmmakers have had over the years is the lack of resources. You know, you're putting up a film that was made for $4 and a bucket of chicken against studio movies. Obviously, there's going to be a difference in the quality of the film. You just You can use every trick in the book that you've learned in the independent space, but at the end of the day, if, if, if the studio director has the super techno crane and all the bells and whistles, and you're using a, a wheelchair with with the guy for a sit, the camera operator sitting in it as a dolly. Right, right. What we did on God's Not Dead. <laughs> um, you, you have some limitations. So so yeah, I mean that's um, that that's just that's just the reality. But but I just I would encourage young filmmakers who are Christians out there that you have to become a master of the craft. You can't just run out and make a movie without understanding how to make a movie. It's, it's like running in, in to the dentist off and say, okay, I'm going to do your filling today. Right. You, you can't do that. You have to learn all of the, all of the techniques you have to, you have to study. You literally have to master the craft before you should be putting content out there to be seen. Right. You, you mentioned budgets and stuff like that. And, and in reality, I, I feel like this is a fair question. I hope it is. How can you, and I use that term, you know, broadly, not you specifically, how can you expect to make the best films out there if you don't have access to the most impressive and talented and sought after actors and producers and set designers, whomever, since these people typically don't want to work on quote unquote face, you know, faith based films. Yeah, it's difficult. You have, you have to find the up and coming actors who are, are going to, to break, um, who are willing to step into that void. There's, you know, casting is one of the most difficult things in this space because they don't want to have that stigma of being in the Christian movie. Um, and it's, it's, it's sad. It really is. And, but I understand it, you know, there's been some really, really, uh, not great Christian movies made. I know I've probably made a couple of them early in my career when, you know, again, it's, it's, it's a learning process and lack of resources. Um, but yeah, so, so we just have to continue to raise our level of expertise so that we can, so that we can connect with the talent and we have to make sure that we have stories that, that we that are that the audiences are going to want to see and hear and at the end of the day it comes down to the material what the script is and whether or not an actor of merit is going to read it and say man i connect with that that's an that's authentic that's an authentic story that's a a real person in a in a difficult situation um and, I, and i'm in and i want to be attached to that so that's really what we need to do we need to continue to to build the level of our content well i know harold that i'm perhaps cutting against the point i was making earlier about how i'm uncomfortable with people being a christian blank like i'm not a christian podcaster i'm a podcaster that happens to be an evangelical christian that believes you know a middle eastern jew was raised on the third day after he was murdered but the thing is is shouldn't christian artists be the best producers of art because i feel like as a christian you have the the fullness of the knowledge of the grandeur of everything because you understand the beauty and the story of the gospel which is the greatest true story ever told you understand the beauty and the grandeur of god in a unique way because you're closer to what it means to have been created as opposed to looking at the world as if it was you know an act of random chance and we're all just you know highly evolved fish or monkeys bumping into other highly evolved fish or monkeys shouldn't christian art Artists, like have that highest of all standards as opposed to, uh, you know, we can give that guy a pass because, you know, he's a Christian singer songwriter. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, I, I, I absolutely believe that. I think that we should have that expectation of excellence in everything that we do. And uh, I think a lot of it comes down to training and, and helping our young, our young people in this space who have interest in this space learn about, about craftsmanship. Mm-hmm. Um, they have to be smart. They have, they have to, um, and they have to be committed to the craft. You know, that's the other thing is everybody wants to run out and do stuff so quick today and get everything up. It takes time. It takes time. You have to develop those skills before you put something out there. Absolutely. I completely agree. And I want to get into a couple of your films now. You already mentioned God's Not Dead, which I think there's like 17 of those films now, but you were affiliated with the first two. And, you know, the plot of the first film, as I know a lot of my audience has seen it, but just for those of you that have not, you know, it was a college philosophy professor named Mr. Radisson, played by Kevin Sorbo, otherwise known as Hercules. And, uh, you know, his curriculum is being challenged by a new student, Josh, who believes that God exists. So that's kind of the first film. And then the second film was when a high school teacher was asked a, a question about Jesus in class and her response, you know, landed her in trouble and you kind of follow all those. So it's a it's a second part, but it doesn't build on the first one. But the thing I want to talk about about those movies, because you can go watch the movies for yourself. You like them or you don't like them. I, I don't really care. Both movies were absolutely eviscerated by the critics. But the audience members seem to like it because for me, I'm a Rotten Tomatoes guy because I don't get the, the opportunity to watch very many films, you know, with, with kids and with uh, businesses and things like that. You know, I might be able to watch the first half of a movie tonight and the second half of a movie tomorrow. Like, that's just kind of how my life is with films. So I can't take a chance on watching a dud. I just can't. So I go to Rotten Tomatoes and I don't care about the critics at all. I care about what the real people think about it. If it's not like 80% or above, I'm probably not going to mess with it. But with your films with a lot of Christian films or films that are kind of in your vein of positivity, I guess the critics numbers are so unbelievably low, but then the audience numbers tend to be really, really high. There's this huge gap between the two numbers. So for you, like, how does that make you feel? Like, do you even care? Because I know a lot of people care about what the critics think. Some people don't care at all. They care about the bottom line. You know, what, what do you care whenever people, you know, think about your film in a certain way? Yeah. So I, for me, I, I don't, I've never read a single review uh, positive or negative of okay. any, any of my films because it's just a endless hole of, you know, it just, it, it wouldn't be healthy. It wouldn't be good. I mean, I have had friends say, Hey, did you hear what so-and-so I'm like, no, and I don't care. Please don't tell me. It doesn't matter. Um, obviously there's a dis- discrepancy when you have a rotten tomato critic score of like 18%, but your, but your audience scores in the eighties, there's probably a little bit of bias there. Right. I mean, just common sense. You look and say, okay, there's some hatred here. That's fine. I don't care. What I look at is what's called the cinema score. Uh, My films have received A or A plus cinema scores, meaning that a person who went to the movie theater and bought a ticket with an interest in the subject matter of the film walked out of the theater and was pulled by someone asking them specifically what they thought about the film. And for me, that means that I'm hitting my mark speaking to the audience that, that the product was designed for, that the, that the story was created for. Um, so that's how I judge my work. And the way Hollywood looks at it is, you're right, if the movie makes a bunch of money, then okay, well, we maybe need to take a, take a look at this space and make sure that we have content that's going to be reaching this audience because obviously there's an audience there. Absolutely. Um, I'm kind of busting up my own interview here, but you, you mentioned something and it kind of made me think of something. I always like to ask people that are artists because it makes them really, really uncomfortable. I'm going to make you pick a favorite kid. So as of right now, so let's say you, we, we cut your career off right at this exact moment. If you could only leave one film, right? So, so one actual full on movie for humanity and, and the rest of your cat, your, 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 filmography or whatever just disappears into the ether. You could leave one film for humanity. What's your favorite? Which one are you leaving? Oh man, that's, I, I, oh. you have to, it's the you're, rule. You're I made up the rules right here on the spot. You have to answer. Okay. Okay. Um, it's a film I'm working on now. I see. It's not ready. That, that was a, it, we're cutting you off today, right at this exact moment. Okay. It's gotta be one that already exists. Well, see, that's, that's the thing. Everybody asks what, what's your favorite movie that you've made? And it's, it's the one that I haven't made yet. It's, it's my next film. Right. right? Um, you know, I think uh, the answer that I'm supposed to give versus the answer that I uh, want to give, um, God's not dead touched so many people. I've heard, I've heard from, from hundreds maybe thousands of people actually at this point. Um, 
what an impact that that thing has had. I mean, just the 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 God's Not Dead Facebook page from people, you know, scrolling through that, and looking at what people have said about how it impacted their lives and people that that they've been associated with, and you know, so the value of 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 souls for me is something that's really um, important. So, um, yeah, I, the the God's Not Dead film, like I said, we we <laughs> we had such such a dearth of resources for that film. I mean, yep. you know, everybody thinks the film was, it cost $2 million to make. And and that's not even, that's nowhere near. We didn't have half of that to make the movie. Um, so I look back at it from a craft perspective and I see, I see all the flaws because I'm an artist and that's who I am. Um, but from the perspective of, of what the film did, uh, how God anointed it and how God used it to, to raise awareness and, and maybe bring people closer to him. That, that has to be the one. Excellent. Now, can you actually get into the project you're working on right now? Can you kind of give us a peek behind the curtain there? I actually can't. Oh, come on. Okay. All right, <laughs> I have, guys. I, have a I, will, strict NDA. I will force him to violate his NDA off air afterwards. And you can just, you know, <laughs> send me a direct message and I'll give you the skinny on it. But I got to say uh, for my money, probably my favorite thing that you've produced that I've seen has been unbroken path to redemption. So that is, it's not really a follow-up movie, but you know, the book unbroken is by Laura Hill and brand. And that's about the insanely crazy story of survival and resilience of Louis Zamperini during world war II. And it's one of my you know top 10 favorite books ever, maybe even top five favorite books ever. It's on our list on our website of the 100 books, every modern Christian man should read list guys. If you have not read the book unbroken by Hill and brand, you've got to actually do that. You got to make yes. sure that that happens, but your film, came after the original Unbroken film from 2014, which was directed by Angelina Jolie and written by the Coen brothers. So, you know, big, enormous budget film, right? But that film didn't focus on kind of what came after, right? Because if you know his story, like his, his plane crash, he was adrift at sea for a long time. He was picked up by the Japanese. He was a POW. That film basically focused on that part of his life. But you focus on after he gets back. So he's a war hero. He's got this crazy, insane story. And you really, really focus in on that part of his life. So I guess for you, did you feel like you had to make that film? Because, you know, the Joe Lee Cohen Brothers film didn't really touch on that. Is it just, you know, after he got back, was it more interesting to you? You know, why why did you do the film in the way you did it? Sure. I, I loved the first film. Angelina, uh, I thought, did a great job of, of exploring, you know, what it was going to take for Louis to actually survive the situation. And, um, when I met the, when I met the producer, Matt bear, um, great guy, Matt is such a talented producer, had a wonderful time with him working on this film. You know, he talked about the first film and why, why they didn't try to do the whole book. And ultimately it just, it would have been a five or six hour film, um, because they wouldn't have been able to do justice to all of the elements in Louis's life. I mean, I mean, literally Louis could have a third or fourth movie about his life after, you know, path to redemption. He just did so much. It was a crazy, <laughs> crazy life. Well lived, I think. Um, but for me, the first film was really about Louis struggle for survival. And the second film after he returns is the struggle for Louis soul. And so it was a little bit more of an internal struggle. And we had um, Sam Hunt did an amazing job portraying Louis and all of his battling, all of his demons um, and I'm super proud of, of that film. Um, again, we didn't have many resources. I mean, we might have had enough money to make our film. Um, it was a, equivalent to what they had for the catering budget for Matt's first Unbroken movie. Um, but, uh, but our talented team at Universal, like everybody rolled up their sleeves. They knew uh, Louis' story and they loved the story. And everybody just... Um, it, it was not, it was a, it was a labor of love for everyone on that set, man. Everybody just, um, just came together and, and helped tell that incredible story. Yeah. I really love the, the performance of the actor that played Louis and the performance that, uh, by the actress that played Louis's, uh, love interest, his wife. I, I think she d did phenomenal. Like it's almost her performance almost sticks with me a little bit more, uh, than, than the other, but for something like that, cause you kind of brought this up. There are films, even long films, like two and a half hour, you know, three hour films that feel like, okay, they left so much on the table. They left so much of the story on the table. So for someone like Louis Zamperini, has there been any talk of making a series, right? You know, kind of like a, you know, 
eight, 10 episode series kind of going into his life where you can focus on, because again, he was like an Olympic level athlete, but then he also went to war and then he was also a POW and then he became a Christian. And then he, you know, he was an alcoholic, you know, like he had all these different parts of his life and, you know, he's passed away now. So I guess we can tell the totality of his story. Has anyone even thought about doing something like that? I'm, I'm not sure. I'll have to ask Matt Bear. <laughs> I'll call Matt and find out if there's anything in the works because Louis was actually, here's the crazy thing. He was actually lost at sea a second time. I don't know if I knew that. Was that in the book? No. Okay. No, it was not. Later in his life, he was actually lost at sea again for like two, like 14 days with a group of people he went on a, a sailing uh, adventure with. Um, like I said, man, this guy's life just was amazing. But uh, you want to talk about a man's man and someone who was who would, just would gut his way through any situation. He just had this indomitable spirit. And, and uh, I just I feel so privileged to have been able to tell to tell that chapter of his life. And and I think part of the, the thing with that film that pleases me the most about it is is I was told that Laura really loved the movie. And, um, and that she had cried watching the movie. And I'm like, you know what, if, if, if we're impacting the author like that, then, then, you know, our team, our team really did, did their job and did it well. Yeah, absolutely. Because again, for someone like her, like when an author writes an autobiography, like the one that she wrote, it's almost like they know the person better than they would even know themselves. Right. Because a lot of people don't have a whole lot of self-reflection, right. Or they, they don't spend a lot of time just sitting around in the quiet, thinking about themselves and who they are. They're always thinking externally. They, they might be asking the internal question of, you know, why am I here? What's the point of life? That type of thing. But I mean, how many thousands of hours did she spend technically trying to get into the head of Louis Zamperini? It's absolutely yes. astonishing. A absolutely. That's absolutely correct. Um, I would say that she probably knew Louis better than, than Louis knew himself. <laughs> Yeah. And I mean, it's just an absolutely great book. I mean, guys, you should definitely go and check it out, but I do want to transition because you know, you, you make films, but now you're dabbling in the world of books yourself because you've got a children's book out called the beard ballad. So this is a book that you wrote for dads and their sons. I'm holding it up in front of the camera. I'm doing the thing, guys, I'm doing the Vanna white thing in front of the camera. The foreword was written by, you know, the patriarch of the duck dynasty family, Phil Robertson. But the thing about this book, is it's unique to me, and I, I won't spoil it for anybody. Well, let, let me just back up a little bit. I want to give you a chance in your own words, since you're the one that wrote this book. What is this book about? And what I guess, what do you want people to walk away from whenever they read the short book, whether it's you know dads or moms or even little little boys? Yeah, I, I more than anything, I want to, I want dads to take away from it. Spend spend some quality time with your sons. It's so important, you know, pouring into. Uh, into your son is going to pay huge dividends in the future. And it's, um, it's going to help form his, his future. It's going to help form his life. Uh, and so the, the more that we can connect with our sons at an early age, um, the better relationship we can develop with them, the, the more that they know they can trust us when they have difficult, difficult questions that, that they need to ask about this crazy world that we live in. And you, and you know that they're going to come to you for the answers rather than somewhere else. Right. I think that's fantastic. So what is, what is the book about? What's the story? I don't want you to ruin it. Cause it's a very short story, guys. You're gonna have to pick it up. It will be in the show notes, but what is the story about? Yeah, it's a, it's about a kid who, uh, who checks out his dad's beard one day and sees that it's growing and, and, uh, they go on a, they go on a, a day off a beard day as, um, dad tells his boss, I got to take a beard day to spend with my son. And then some, some fun magical type stuff happens uh, along the way. Um, you know, growing up, I was really inspired by by Maurice Sendak, um, who wrote Where the Wild Things Are. Mm. Um, he's one of my favorite authors and, and illustrators and this super talented guy and um, imaginative and also Dr. Seuss. So it's got a couple of those fun, whimsical elements to it that it's um, but it's just really affirming for sons and fathers and for manliness and uh, going out and getting your hands dirty and, and doing manly things. Well, let's talk about that even a little bit further, because again, I have a son now, so I'm not sure when this is going to be released, but right now he's like 19 months old. I've got a son that's Lord willing on the way here soon. Again, he may already be here by the time you guys hear this episode, but I'm very concerned about some of the things that I see that are for their entertainment. Cause if you just walk into Barnes and Noble and you go to the children's book section, you know, right there in the front is, you know, the gay BCs and you know, uh, the, these books about the little kids that think they're the opposite gender and you know, all this gender confusion and LGBTQ nonsense and, and 
That's just what's constantly being thrust upon our children. Even in, you know, you, you get it when you watch Sesame Street, you get it when you watch Disney Channel as a parent. I feel like I'm constantly going to have to run interference so that I can give my son a sexual biblical ethic, so that I can give him an ethic as to what it means to be male and female, those types of things. So is that also a motivation to write a book like this? Because to be honest, I, I know of like three books that are kind of in this vein that are appropriate and affirming for young boys to be masculine. Yeah, I, I think so. My, growing up, um, my dad took me hunting and fishing, and I learned so much from him about being a man through those activities. And I, I noticed that there weren't a lot of books out there for for fathers specifically to read to their sons. And you know how the story kind of came about one day was was I picked Harry up and I gave him a big bear hug and I rubbed my cheek against his, and he pushed me away and he said, "Dad, your your face is all pokey and rough." And I said, "Yeah, those are my ferocious facial follicles." <laughs> And in that moment, the story was kind of boring. So the next day I went to the, uh, the coffee shop um, where I do a lot of writing for my screenplays. And I sat down and I was actually going to start working on a screenplay. And the book just kind of poured out of me. I just felt like it was kind of given to me, like yeah. a gift. And I'm like, all right. Um, and so I wrote it and I sent it to my good friend, Troy Duhon. Troy is the executive producer behind the God's Not Dead series. And I said, hey, man, take a look at this. And he read it and he's like, Harold, man, this is a gift. Uh, there is such a gender identity crisis right now going on in our country. And I think that this book is something that's special and that it, it highlights that. And I think it's something we need to get out there as an option for families. Um, and so, um, so Troy got behind the book in a big way. And that's how, um, yeah, I know Phil Robertson came on board. I've worked with the, the Duck Dynasty family on both God's Not Dead 1 and 2. William Corey on one and, and Sadie on two and, uh, and, and Phil loved the book and, and said, yeah, I'd love to do it. So imagine that Phil liked a book about beards. That's a, a shocking revelation, but <laughs> you brought something up there, uh, about, you know, and again, I, I talked about it a little bit as well, the transgenderism with, with kids and the gender confusion and young people. Now, I know a lot of my friends, uh, they have taken their kids out of the public school. So they're either homeschooling or they're, they're doing Christian private school and, and things like that. And they've, they've worked with the administration to say, hey, if a little boy, you know, six-year-old walks up to you and says, I think I'm a girl, how does the administration handle that? And their answer was, you know, ple pleasing enough to them to where they felt okay with enrolling their kid in that school. But for the parents out there, for the dads that maybe they don't have the option to take their kid to private school. Maybe it's not really going to work out for them to do homeschooling because of their, their work-life balance or, you know, who knows what, what should we do? Cause I've talked about a lot on the show. I've given my own ideas about it, but what should we do to help inform and, or I guess, protect our young children from this creeping satanic ideas about transgenderism and overall just gender confusion? Well, that's a good question. It's probably a question that's way above my pay grade because <laughs> I'm, I'm just a, I'm just a, a filmmaker and an artist. But but what I know for me personally is that I'm I'm going to invest in my son. I'm going to share my experiences with my son. I'm going to give him as much as I can. I'm going to pour into him what my beliefs are, uh, and and I think that's I think that's all we can do, really, because at the end of the day, we can we can fight a fight against that stuff. But it, but really, what it is 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 it's about love and a connection with your son and or daughter, and making sure that they know where where your hope comes from and where and and where your love comes from for them. I think it's about equipping them. I mean, here at Undaunted Life, we say all the time, it's about equipping men to be able to push back darkness, okay? Because that's the thing is like my podcast isn't always going to be here. I'm not always going to be here. Right. You know, my website could go away and then and everything I've ever produced could go away with it. Right. So you have to be equipped on your own to be able to push back darkness. You can't just depend on your pastor. You can't depend on your your favorite Christian filmmaker. You can't depend on your favorite Christian podcast or any of those things. You have to be able to push back darkness. And I guess in that vein, how are we to push back against the darkness that pervades the culture when it comes to the claims of toxic masculinity? And I'm not going to let you get away with it's above your pay grade because you're right in line with this because I know that you've, I mean, you know, you have a son, or I believe you, is it one son or do you have multiple sons? One son. Okay. So you're one son and I, I currently have one son that is here on, on this, you know, planet outside the womb. And I'm very, very focused on making sure that he never looks at himself as toxically masculine simply because he has XY chromosomes. But from your perspective, how should we push back against the darkness of people that are basically saying masculinity is in and of itself toxic? 
Well, I, I just think it's a, it's a conversation. I mean, I, I know so many good men in this world. They're, they're hardworking guys. And um, <laughs> me and a bunch of my, I mean, we call ourselves trucker mouth Christians. You know, we're, 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 we're men. We, we make mistakes all the time. We're broken. We're flawed. But you know what? The, the idea of a future without men who are doing wonderful things to provide for their families and provide for our, our society, our, our future is way more bleak without that presence. You know, um, I'm going to I'm going to provide for my family. I'm going to defend my family. I'm going to be there for them. I'm going to do the best I can to 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 walk the walk of a Christian man. Um, and I just, I can't, even, I can't imagine what a world would be without that sort of strength and, and, uh, commitment to, to families and communities. So I, I just, it, a world without that doesn't make sense to me. Absolutely. It doesn't make sense because we were designed to do the things that culture is telling us we're not allowed to do now. And so we're working against our designer. We're working against God, but there's part of this as well that, you know, a lot of men either they're, they're not aware of, or they don't really focus on it. But part of the problem is as the West, the capital W West, our culture does not focus on rites of passage for our young men. We don't focus on ushering our young men into manhood. They basically, you know, self-actualize. They decide when they become a man. Maybe it's the first time they have sex, first time they get a job, when they move away from home, you know, something like that. But we're not helping them. I mean, there are like small sects of certain Christian or certain religions, I guess, that do a decent job of kind of doing that. But modern Christendom, we don't do that. We don't really do that in our church. And I feel like it's doing a major disservice to our young men. And that's something that I'm working really, really hard on behind the scenes. And, and hopefully we can announce some stuff soon that will help, uh, help parents and help dads with that. But why do you feel like our culture doesn't feel like they need to focus on rites of passage for young men? Well, that's a great question. Um, and, and I know, look, I know where I'm from in, in Northern Michigan. Uh, a lot of dads would say that we do have this rite of passage. It's, it's fishing and hunting season, and it's passing down our beliefs and our values to our sons in those moments, because it's right about that age when you can start bow hunting and rifle hunting. And, um, you know, my dad, uh, I, I went on a fishing trip with him to the upper peninsula and, on that trip is where he shared with me the the birds and the bees, and it was it's a time I'll never forget. Um, it was way, my dad created a core memory for me by taking me and putting me in this wonderful situation outdoors, in nature, where we're experiencing the bounty of, of our Lord, and um, and then he shared this really important message with me, right? And and one of the, so I, I think that that's something that we can do as dads is if we find a way to make sure that our sons know that they're that they're transitioning into manhood and and use some sort of event, whether it's volunteering at some sort of local community shelter or so, something to show men that young men that we have to help take care of our culture and our society. Um, and that's that's and, our, and provide for our families. And, and that's a way of making that transition into manhood. When I think one thing as well, because that, that's a great story for, that you have and a great memory that you have with your dad. I have some similar memories, not around hunting, but similar memories that are kind of in that vein. But for a lot of guys, it's haphazard. It's ran, it, you know, it's, it's completely random. It's not something that is, uh, there's no structure to it. And I know you can have too much rigidity in things and it kind of takes the, the excitement out of it for, you know, the dad and the kid. But I think the more structure we can have around these things, because it's like, there's a lot of structure when you uh, go through and have your bar mitzvah right? There's a lot of structure there. There's a lot of things that you know about. And so for a lot of dads, as opposed to kind of the random, Hey, I woke up my kid so he could watch the end of game seven of the world series or, or something like that. Hey, I think for a lot of dads, it, it really, really helps if they can do things a little bit more specific than that. But Harold, we've talked about a lot of things in this interview, but I do have one more segment I want to get to. So at the end of my interviews, a lot of the interviews I do, I do a segment called, what would you say to someone that said, and so I will say that, what would you say to someone that said, and then I will fill in the blank. And it's going to be a random thing that I fill in the blank with, but this is lightning round. You have 30 seconds maximum to give me your answer. And you're, you're, you're a pretty oh. direct guy. So I kind of like it, but we're going to see how much trouble we can get in here at the end of the podcast. So you open for it. Uh, I, I I'm ready to go. I'm terrified. <clears throat> Let's do it. Yeah, it's not going to be too bad. It'll be like ripping off duct tape off your skin. It's okay. Here's the first one. What would you say to someone that said Christian movies are corny? I would say, uh, you're right. And we're trying to fix that. 
Okay. See, you're doing just fine. You nailed the first one. Let's see if we can go two for two. What would you say to someone that said beards are gross? Uh, I would say at times you're right because I found a lot of food in this um, after a big meal, but they're also beautiful. They certainly are, which leads me to the next one. What would you say to someone that said beards are awesome? Say so you're absolutely right. 1000%. Yeah, it's the only correct answer. Like any other answer would not be appropriate. All right, let's keep it going. What would you say to someone that said, I'm scared to show a Christian movie to my friends? I would say, let's talk about a couple movies that that would be worth uh, be worth the effort. Perhaps Unbroken Path to Redemption or God's Not Dead or something like that. Yeah, it's okay to be self-serving. That's all right. All right, let's keep it going. What would you say to someone that said, there's too much focus on fathers and sons and not on fathers and daughters? Um, I would say you can't compare the two that way. There needs to be focus on both. And I think that uh, that right now, investing in our sons is just as important as investing in our daughters. So I feel like um, to, to put one above the other is a mistake. All right, just a few more left. What would you say to someone that said gender is a spectrum? Wow. Um, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. I can't answer that question. I've, I've never had that issue. Um, I would say to, to pray about it. That's the best thing I can do because um, I can't imagine what it's like to be someone who's struggling with that sort of issue in their lives. Um, so prayer for me is the, is the, is the, where I go when I can't find the answers. Well, just to be clear on this, I'm assuming you do believe that there are only male and female. There is only XX and XY. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a medical doctor. I don't know if they're, um, I mean, very specifically, uh, physical traits of different organs. Um, I know that there's sometimes can be some issues there. So I don't know the answer to that question. And that's the honest to goodness truth. Okay. Well, we'll, we'll uh, keep going, but you don't have to be a medical doctor to realize that there are only two options. There's XX and XY chromosomes. There are either males or females, God and, you know, man and woman, he created them, that type of a thing. But we'll kind of get out of there because you probably What I'm don't. saying is I haven't done enough research on that front to actually give you an answer. And okay. that's my, that's the, tr that's the truth. Okay. Fair enough. I'm not, I'm not avoiding the question. I just don't have, I haven't educated myself enough to actually tell you what I believe is true. Stop avoiding my questions, Harold. I'm not avoiding the question. Guys, Answer guys, it. I'm Truthfully. not actually angry. Come on, guys, relax. All right, a couple more left. What would you say okay. to someone that said, I fear that my son will inherit my worst qualities? I would say that's probably true. <laughs> <laughs> but it's your job as a father to help educate him out of those. Let him, um, let him learn from your mistakes. Um, as we have all made terrible mistakes as dads, give yourself a break. We all mess up. We all screw up. Uh, re re ask for forgiveness and move forward and, and do everything you can to help him avoid the traps that you fell into. I love it. That's a great answer. All right. Last question of the day. What would you say to someone that said masculinity is inherently toxic? I would say I vehemently disagree with that. Okay. I vehemently disagree as well. That is why I'm here. But man, we've gone everywhere in this conversation. We've covered a lot of ground in a short period of time, but that is all for me. Is there anything else you want to get off your chest? You know what? I would just want to say thank you to your listeners because I know a lot of them have been supporters of, of Christian films, of my films. And um, I just want to say this. We're in a period right now where um, it's incredibly difficult for, for filmmakers who are Christians to get their work out there. And when, when they do bring a film like, like American underdog that just came out, um, when we do get films like that into the theater, it's so important that your audience, our audience go and support these types of films, because the one thing that the studios will, will see is when those films make money, they will finance more of those movies. Right. So if you want to see content like God's Not Dead, like Unbroken Path to Redemption, like American Underdog, if you want to see if you want to see those films continue to arrive in your local theater, when they do, you have to get off the couch and you have to go to the theater to go see them. Right. And if you can't do that, at least rent them at home. Because if you stop going to see those movies, 
the studios will stop hiring us to make them right. and then we're done. Guys, you have to follow the money. Everyone has a money bend, especially for a corporation. Why do you think a lot of these corporations are signaling this woke virtue stuff? It's because they think they can turn it into dollars. That's the only reason that they're doing it. But before I get off on another tangent, I just want to thank you, Harold Cronk, for coming on Undaunted Life of Man's podcast. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate your uh, authenticity, man. There you go, guys. I hope you enjoyed the interview with Harold Kronk. But before we let you go, we are going to do a quick resilience boost at Undaunted Life. Our mission is equipping men to push back darkness with content that forges spiritual, mental, and physical resilience. So I've only got one link for you today, and it is linked to where you can go buy your own copy of The Beard Ballad, but also, guys, any of his movies. Okay, so I, I didn't want to put a thousand different links in here because I know you guys get all your entertainment in different places and different streaming platforms and whatever, but make sure you go and support his films, go and support Christian filmmaking. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to the show. We do appreciate it. Wherever you're listening to this, please subscribe, rate, and leave us a positive five-star review. And if you want to come speak live at your event or on your podcast, just shoot me an email to info at undaunted.life. That's I-N-F-O at undaunted.life. You can follow us on Instagram and TikTok and like us on Facebook, and you can check out our website for everything else, including how to donate to keep more content like this is coming your way. Just go to www.undaunted.life. And we want to also thank the band August Burns Red for allowing us to use their music for our content. The music on this podcast is their song Cutting the Tides, which is off their 10th anniversary re-recording of their album Leveler. The links are in the description. I'm your host, Kyle Thompson. Remember, keep pushing back darkness, keep forging spiritual, mental, and physical resilience, keep seeking the Lion of Judah. <laughs>